Okay, so today we're covering category 2B, which is about prokaryotes and viruses. So, um, you know, obviously viruses are, are a very hot topic now. Uh, prokaryotes as well, mostly this section kind of focuses on, you know, their anatomy and how they have an effect on us as humans, right? So, and it's also good to kind of look into prokaryotes and viruses, and then later we'll be able to compare to our own eukaryotic um, cells and see the similarities and the differences. So where does this all start, right? I'm sure you probably heard the name Robert Hooke before. He's the first person who kind of uh, to use microscopes and observe those cells and come up with the idea of it. And so then we have this idea of cell theory, right? And the cell theory has three major components. All living organisms are at least one cell, right? And cells are the most basic unit of life. Nothing below cells are considered alive. And this is one also very important. All cells came from other cells. So these were the original three ideas that about of, of the cell theory, right? And as we, you know, theories are, theories can be updated and, you know, disproven or whatever, right? The, a theory in science, this is always like a thing where like people are like, oh, evolution is just a theory, right? Or whatever, right? Gravity is also just a theory. A theory is a scientific body of evidence, right? That we have enough evidence that we consider this to be overall like true, right? However, it's still a theory because we don't say that like this is 100% factual and that nothing could ever possibly uh, contradict it, right? No, we leave it open for the theory to be modified or changed or, you know, if new evidence arises, we alter the theory. So that's why this is just a cell theory, even though we can look at our own cells and observe the cells, right? It's a theory because, you know, as we kept going, we understood more and more about cells. And the main update was that, you know, we learned that DNA is our genetic material in the cells, right? And how cells transfer their, um, their genetic material. So this could be considered like the fourth tenet, that DNA is genetic information of the cell. So with cells, right, we have prokaryotes and eukaryotes are the major uh, cell types that you need to know about. And viruses are not cells. Remember, we consider that cells are the most basic unit of life and viruses are acellular. They don't operate through cells. So therefore we don't consider them to be living. Okay, so we're gonna cover mitosis and meiosis next week when we cover eukaryotes. Right now we're going to focus on the prokaryotes. So prokaryotes, okay. So prokaryotes are, there's basically two different types of prokaryotes that you need to know for the MCAT basically. And that is the archaea. And so there's, so there's eukaryotes, right? Like us, then there's archaea and then there's bacteria or prokaryotes, right? So actually, sorry, no, both of these are prokaryotes. Archaea and bacteria are both prokaryotes, but they have the domain archaea or the domain bacteria, right? So bacteria is probably what you usually think of when you think about a prokaryote, stuff like E. coli. Whereas Archaea is like a little less uncommon. Archaea live in the extreme environments. So you, have, you might have heard of thermophiles or halophiles. That means that thermophiles are uh, these cells that prefer high temperature environments and halophiles prefer high salt environments. So they, they thrive under those extreme uh, conditions. And... Um, Yes, prokaryotes. So the domain bacteria are prokaryotes. So they're single cell organisms. Oh, right. So the major difference between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes we kind of touched upon before, no membrane bound organelles and they don't have a nucleus, right? So when we say no membrane bound organelles, we mean no mitochondria, no endoplasmic trigulum, no lysosomes, nothing like that. The organelles that they do have are the ribosomes because ribosomes are not membrane bound. They're just in the cytosol. So they do have ribosomes and they have slightly different ribosomes, um, but they don't have membrane-bound organelles. And um, 
Yeah. So that's the base, the major, the two d different um, between archaea and bacteria. Now, bacteria, we can break down more, right? So bacteria have three major kinds of uh, shapes that we can classify them by. Remember, we talked about, we keep talking about shape and function, structure and function, right? In this case, there's three major categories, uh, cocci, bacilli, and spiruli. So the cocci is the spherical ones, the bacilli is like a long string, and the spiruli is a, is a spiral, right? So you can kind of, they're kind of, um, the spiruli is obviously a spiral, the bacilli, I think of like the basilisk from like the big snake monster. It's like a long string. And the cocci, I just think of like a circle or something because it's like circular cocci. So, and you can see they have a little um, size notation here in the bottom. Uh, you don't, I don't think you need to know specifically the sizes between these three, but you do need to know in the grand scheme of things, like how does a eukaryotic cell compare to the average prokaryotic cell compared to the average virus particle. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, the other thing that you can, oh, another important thing is that when it comes to uh, this, right? So if you, you've probably heard of strep throat, right? Streptococcus, right? It has the structure in the name. So a streptococcus is a cocci-shaped bacteria. Lactobacillus is a, uh, is a bacilli shaped bacteria. So we can, we can, like they're saying, we can infer their shapes based on the name of the, uh, the bacteria. Okay. So then um, <clears throat> another important classification of bacteria, oh, oxygen for metabolism, right. So not all bacteria metabolize oxygen. Um, they have, and the ones that do metabolize oxygen don't all do it in the same way. So how can we, how can we kind of, uh, observe this? So what you can do is you have like a test tube and you have agar at the bottom and agar is just a medium for, for, um, bacteria to grow. And you can kind of see where the bacteria settle and start growing. And that will inform you like what kind of aerobe they are. So for example, if a bacteria prefers oxygen, do you think they will be at the bottom of this test tube or at the top of the test tube? The top, right? Because the top is where the oxygen is. So let's draw, let's draw it out. The O2 would be, the O2 would be up here. So if the O2 is up here and the bacteria are all at the top with the O2, that tells us we that tells us that they need that oxygen to survive because we don't we have a complete absence of the bacteria at the bottom. They're unable to survive without the oxygen. That tells us they're an obligate aerobe. Obligate meaning you need aerobe, meaning we need to metabolize oxygen, aerobic, aerobic respiration, right? So uh remember that we have two types of respiration, right? We have aerobic respiration, which uses O2. And then we have anaerobic respiration, which does not use O2. And anaerobic respiration is also called fermentation, right? So when we talked about um, metabolism in our own bodies, our regular Glycolysis into Krebs cycle into electron transport chain uses O2 as the final electron acceptor. Whereas anaerobic respiration is when we do fermentation. When we do fermentation and our pyruvate gets turned into lactate instead, instead of going down into the Krebs cycle. So we see that there are similar modes of, of metabol metabolism involving oxygen. So as you said, the obligate aerobes are going to be at the top with the oxygen. Then we have obligate anaerobes, which is just the opposite. They need, they can't survive in the presence of oxygen. So there's nothing up here because if there is oxygen, it hurts them. So they prefer to go down to the bottom where there is no oxygen. That's an obligate anaerobe. Now a facultative aerobe is pretty interesting. Facultative, so we see here in these two, right? There is bacteria in spread across the whole system, right? So what's the difference here? 
Well, we can see that in the top here, there's a greater concentration of bacteria, right? There's a greater concentration. So what that means is, if there's a greater concentration up here, does this bacteria prefer the oxygen or do they prefer the no oxygen environment? If there's a greater concentration towards the top where the oxygen is. Right, they prefer the O2. So this is called, so, this, so we know it's an aerobe, right? Because it's using the oxygen. This is called a facultative aerobe. And what that means is if the oxygen is present, it will go there and it will use the oxygen because it can utilize it well. It makes use of its faculties. You can think of it that way. So a facultative aerobe will take advantage of the oxygen, but also it will take advantage of, of the space here because it can survive without the oxygen. And in some ways, that's kind of similar to, to what we do, right? We prefer to use oxygen because it helps us, it, it, we get more energy out of it. But in the absence of oxygen, if we're running hard, we're exercising, we're not getting enough air, then we can do fermentation in a pinch, right? So this is kind of similar to, to, to what our cells do, where we have both options available to us. And that's a facultative arrow. Now, the other thing, so the difference, right? We talked in this one, it's spread out around, but there's not a greater concentration up here. If there's not a greater concentration up here, that's telling us that these bacteria are not actually using the O2. They're not actually making use of the O2 that's up here. So this is called an aerotolerant anaerobe. What it means is that it tolerates the presence of oxygen and it neither harms nor helps it. The presence of oxygen doesn't bother it. It will grow there, but it's not going to get a boost in growth from it. So that's different compared to obligate anaerobes because they cannot tolerate the oxygen up here. They can't, they have to go down here. Whereas the aerotolerant anaerobes are able to tolerate the oxygen up here. So they grow out, they grow throughout. So that's a pretty interesting. And if you ever took microbio, you probably do um, an experiment like this where you see how bacteria grow differently based on their metabolism. So yeah. Uh, any questions about that? I think I think this is pretty cool and kind of like makes a lot makes sense. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about how bacteria um, engage with us, engage with animals, right? So obviously we know like we can have bacterial infections and 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 issues, right, from bacteria. Um, so. There's parasitic bacteria that are harming us and gaining all the benefit, right? So, are there, yeah, mosquitoes, sure. Mosquitoes come and they take our blood and, and they just leave. They, they get all the, all the benefit of your blood and you get like an itchy welt, right? Symbiotic bacteria are having a good relation, a mutual beneficial relationship. So they're providing stuff to us and we're providing stuff to them. That is basically like the gut bacteria that we have that helps us with digestion and helps us. And while we provide them a space to grow and flourish. Okay. So now we're going to get into like the anatomy of what makes a prokaryote a prokaryote. First of all, we have to, the major thing, the major difference between our cells and a bacterial cell is this concept of the cell wall. Right, this rigid structure that's around the 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 cell membrane, right, and around the cell wall. Um, well, okay, wait. Let me talk about. So, okay, yeah. There is a polysaccharide called peptidoglycan, which is unique to the um, prokaryotes. This is really good. It's really good for us that peptidoglycan is totally unique to bacteria because that that's what allows us to use that's kind of um why antibiotics can be so effective and not hurt us at all because we have this unique uh sugar in in the in the bacteria that we can directly target so anything if you have an enzyme or something that directly attacks peptidoglycan 
it won't affect our cells at all because we have no peptidoglycan. So this is really good. And um, oh yeah, antibiotics use enzymes to destroy the peptidoglycan and render the bacterial cell fragile, right? Why is it rendering it fragile? Because the cell wall provides the structural support for the integrity of the prokaryote. And once the cell wall gets destroyed, then the, the, the prokaryote is more um, uh, vulnerable, right? So there's two major types of cell walls, essentially. And the two major types of cell walls are this left one, where you have a, a bilayer, right? You have a membrane, and then you just have this giant cell wall on top. That's a bunch of stacks of peptidoglycan. This is called a gram-positive cell. We're going to talk about what that means. The other option is that there is a membrane and then a small layer of cell wall and then another membrane. And this is called a gram-negative cell. Now, a gram cell, what gram, what, what that, what gram means is referring to gram staining. So you can actually, um, you can kind of identify a cell based on the staining procedure that you could do in the lab. And when you do the staining procedure, the cells that are positive or the cells that have only one bile, one membrane, the cells that are positive will show up as dark purple. The cells that are negative, right? Or, or the cells with a double membrane will show up as pink. So this is a way for us to distinguish different bacteria, right? What we're doing is we are, the bacteria is heat fixed, so it was dead, right? We apply crystal violet dye. We add iodide to trap the dye to this layer, to this, to this, to the, to the cell wall layer, right? We wash it with ethanol or acetone to remove the membrane in the gram negative bacteria, to remove this membrane layer. And then we apply another stain. So this process is going to allow us to distinguish these types of bacteria. And um, the major thing is because, why do we want to distinguish these? This gram negative, remember our antibiotics, what's the, what did we say was our target of our antibiotics? This peptidoglycan cell wall, right? Because this is unique to bacteria. Now, when it comes to a gram negative uh, bacteria, not only do they have this outer membrane kind of protecting their cell wall, they have less of the cell wall. They just have a thin layer. So it's harder for antibiotics to affect gram-negative cells, a gram-negative bacteria, than gram-positive bacteria. So gram-negative bacteria has, has more um, antibiotic resistance than the, than the gram-positive bacteria because their, peptidocell their peptidoglycan cell wall is exposed and their one isn't. So now you know the reason why some bacteria are much more resistant to antibiotics than others. Okay. So um, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so okay, yeah, this is pretty cool too. So when we talk about... Um, so bacteria, we just talked about how we have metabolism, right? Through oxygen, right? And they actually do a very similar function um, through, let me see if I can find a good picture. Mm, let's just search for one. I want uh, bacterial ATP production. No, this is a mitochondria. So basically, ah, okay. So, so, so here's the thing, right? This structure, right? We see, we've seen this kind of structure already, right? With the, uh, with our um, electron transport chain. What we have is at the end of our electron transport chain, in our mitochondria. We have the system happening. The, this, these little blue blocks are happening right here, right? And so we have this uh, space. Let me just draw. 
we have two spaces here. We have one space inside, which is called our mitochondrial matrix, right? Mitochondrial matrix, the inner space. And then outside it, we have the inner membrane space. So inside these like twisted uh, membrane layers and outside the layers. So in red, I'm shading like outside the outer space. And in yellow, I'm shading the inner space. So this is how, because we have two different environments, right? We can do our electron transport chain and allow protons to get pumped and then come back. Bacteria can do the exact same thing, but they don't have any membrane bound organelles, right? They don't. So what do they do? They do the same process, but the membrane that they're using is just the, their own, wait, where is it? I had a good picture. The membrane that they're using is just their own cell membrane, right? And what they're doing is they're pumping out into the, into the outside of the cytoplasm and just bringing it back in. So they're just using their own, um, their own cell membrane to, to, to do this because they don't have any other membrane inside, any organelles inside. So it's the same, it's the same process of ATP synthase, but just in a different location. So, and we talked about how, you know, there are ribosomes and the ribosomes are different in bacteria compared to eukaryotes because prokaryotic ribosomes are 30, 50 combining to 70, eukaryotes are 40, 60 combining to 80. Um, mm -mm. Oh, this is the density unit explanation. The sedimentation rate, how long it takes for the ribosome to sink to the bottom of a test tube. Oh, huh, okay. The more you know. Um, another important property of bacteria is movement, right? Okay, so how do they move? So let's look at how do they move. Right, and we just talked about the, uh, the cell wall. Oh, if you ever did in, in lab class, you might have seen like, um, if you ever looked at a plant, because plants also have cell walls, if you did an experiment with like hypertonic or hypotonic conditions, you could see this where the cytoplasm shrinks, right? As, as, as water leaves the cell, but it remains attached, like the structure of the cell wall remains um, firm, right? So this is kind of, this is kind of interesting that bacteria have a similar thing with the, with the, with the cell wall. Um, okay. Right. So how do they move, right? So they have, this whole thing is called the, the flagella, right? The flagella, and they move like propellers. So the way they work is they have this long tail-like thing called the filament, right? The filament is attached to something called the basal body, and the basal body is basically a motor, basically a motor that spins the, the filament. And they're attached with a hook. So the three, don't worry about like all these other things, filament, hook, basal body. That's what you need to know about um, how a flagella moves, right? And so they can, they have, based on the direction that they rotate their flagella, they can move. And they, and the way that they move is through um, chemotaxis. So they basically respond to the chemical signals of the environment. And that tells them like, I want to move toward this, or I want to move away from this. So they can, they, if they rotate clockwise, they'll tumble and they'll spin or they can move towards something, right? So they basically move like, kind of like you would, like a tank, right? Like they don't turn while they're moving. They go straight, then turn, then straight, then turn. That's how, that's kind of how they move. And um, right, without a chemical gradient, they, they just, they have no overall movement. They're just moving around. But if there's a chemical gradient, if something is attracting them, they're going to move overall more towards that thing because they, they have like cellular uh, signaling that's telling them like there's something over there that we should go to. Might be oxygen, might be food, might be whatever, right? But they have ways to, to, to mobilize themselves to where they need to get to. 
Okay. The pili we'll talk about is for is for the F factor cells. It's for conjugation. We'll talk about that. Um, and we talk, and we we talked extensively about DNA and how there is no nucleus, right? So the DNA in the prokaryotes is in the nucleoid region, right? And it's circular. It's circular. This is a big point. Yeah, the eukaryotes have these long strings of chromosomes, right? We talked about how many different chromosomes there are, whereas prokaryotic DNA is just a long, big circle, just a long circle. And they also have small circles that are called plasmids. So those are important. That's how they kind of, that's how bacteria uh, can get new traits. So we'll talk about that. So, so binary fission, is what bacterial reproduction is called. And it's essentially cloning. It essentially, the, bac the bacteria essentially clones itself. So what does that mean? We have this original bacteria here and it has its DNA. It has a plasmid form of a DNA, right? A small little ring of containing DNA and its overall genome, all right? So what does it do? It duplicates its DNA. The cell itself grows bigger and bigger. It starts to split off. It splits off, boom. We now have two identical copies of the, of the original bacteria. So this is essentially cloning. And um, so when a bacterial colony grows, right, it goes through several different phases. And it goes through several different phases of this, right? And you'll notice that, like, you know, you have one, right, and then you have two. Then these two are each going to make two more. Then those four are each going to make two more, right? So we're going to grow exponentially, right? We're going to grow exponentially. And this is kind of um, what this graph here is trying to tell you. There's four major phases to a bacteria's colony growth cycle. And so imagine that you're putting in um, bacteria into a, an, a, a petri dish or an agar plate, right? And you're measuring like, how do they grow over time? Well, first off, there's something called the lag phase. And the lag phase is when you're getting adjusted to the environment. So for example, if you decide to start studying at a new environment, right? Like the light, you go to the library for the first time, then you might need to find out where the bathroom is. You might need to find out where you're most comfortable sitting. You're getting adjusted to a new environment. And the bacteria does this the same way because, you know, they might need to adjust to what the food is in the environment. They might need to flip some uh, genetic switches or molecular switches saying like, okay, we're going to be using, this is the primary uh, sugar that's available to me. So I'm going to be utilizing this sugar and I'll turn off my enzyme production for other sugars or something, right? Lag phase is when the bacteria is getting used to the environment and it's optimizing itself for the best growth in that environment. Now, once it's optimized itself, once it optimizes itself, we hit this log phase of exponential growth. This is when the bacteria have hit its stride and they're growing and they're growing and they're growing. And like you see here, they're growing exponentially, right? Now, what happens when we are hitting a, so obviously like, you know, when there's only one bacteria, he's got plenty of resources. Two bacteria, plenty of resources around. Four bacteria, plenty of resources around. Eight bacteria, plenty of resources. But once you keep going and going and going, at some point, the environment kind of hits its carrying capacity. And the carrying capacity is like how much resources it has to support all of the bacteria there. And not only that, the bacteria, as they're growing, are producing waste products, right? So if that waste products are all stuck there, then it's going to be a problem. So we hit something called the stationary phase, where because there are only a certain number of resources, the number of bacteria are now leveling off. Because what that means is that we are making new bacteria, but there's also a lot of bacteria dying at the same time because they're just running out of resources. There's just not enough resources. So we're hitting this this area where we're stagnant. We're not growing and we're not shrinking. We're just stagnant, right? And finally, as the stagnant period keeps going and going and we keep consuming resources, keep consuming resources, keep consuming, 
finally, at some point, we've run out of resources. We run out of uh, meta things to metabolize, right? And at that point, the cells begin to die because there's no more resources. There's no way to make more cells. The cells that are already present there can't survive. They'll die off, right? So this is this is always a pattern of how bacteria a bacterial colony will grow, right? An example of a positive feedback loop, yeah, because um, bacteria, as they grow, they're just going to grow more. Bacteria never hit a point where they're like, oh, yeah, this is good enough. Like, we don't need to keep going. They're just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, linear increase during log phase is actually, because this is a log, right? This looks, this may look linear, but it's exponential, right? This is like, if this was a, a linear graph, then it would be, if this was a linear graph, you'd be looking at something like, like, right? Like it, it's exploding in, in its growth right here because it, it's exponential, like why, how I explained. One to two, two to four, four to eight, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so antibiotic resistance, right? So antibiotics, so let's talk a little bit about plasmids first. Um, let's see. Mm, yeah. So in a bacterial cell, is it showing the plasmid or not? Mm, not really. Okay, this is, all right. So this is a bacterial cell, right? And bacterias can take up this uh, DNA that's in the environment, right? If it's just a small circular piece of DNA, it's called a plasmid. And so it's exogenous DNA because this plasmid did not start in the bacteria. It's, it's outside somewhere in the environment. And the, the bacteria can take up this plasmid, right? And if it takes up the plasmid, the plasmid is now here, right? And the plasmid, can get incorporated into the whole chromosome of the, the original chromosome of the, uh, of the bacteria. So why this is important is because this is how bacteria can become antibiotically resistant, right? If this plasmid has an antibiotic resistance gene and this bacteria picks it up and eventually integrates it into its chromosome, it is now antibiotically resistant. That's, that's, that's how bacteria can do that. So um, how else to explain this? Right, so antibiotic resistance, right? Um, there's also, so there's many ways for bacteria to become antibiotic res resistant. And you've probably heard of the problem of, of superbugs in the hospital, right? Because in the hospital, the hospital is such a, so here's a, here's a difficult thing about, and this is why your doctors tell you like to complete your antibiotic regimen, right? They're very, they're, they're always emphasized, like eat it as, as, as we told you, don't just stop it when you feel better. Why? Because the anti, the bacteria that if you, so if you have like, let's draw this out. Let's say you have a group, let's say that this is a group of bacteria, right? Let's say you have four bacteria in your system, right? And you take your antibiotics and that kills off like three of those bacteria. But one of that bacteria survives and that bacteria actually by some mutation is antibiotically resistant. Because you killed off the previously, right? These four bacteria, remember, we talked about the, the stationary phase and the competition for resources. Previously, these four bacteria were each getting 25% of the resources, right? However, because you killed off all the bacteria that are antibiotically not resistant, the ones that, so, that could be killed through the antibiotics, what you've left is an antibiotically resistant one. So let me make this one a different color. That will be 
Oh no, it won't do that. Okay, never mind. Um, so in any case, this one is let's just make it right. So the capital, the big, the big O is the antibiotic resistance one, right? And so now once we killed all the non-antibiotic resistant ones, the one that is antibiotic resistance, guess what? He now has access to hundred percent of the resources. So what's gonna happen? you're going to have an explosion of antibiotically resistant bacteria. And they're all antibiotically resistant. So this is a big problem of overusing antibiotics, overusing antibiotics in the um, like farming industry, right? Or in the, I think there was a big thing a while ago. I forgot where it was. I think it was in the UK or something, but they were using an antibiotic that was like, the strongest antibiotic, like the last line of defense antibiotic for raising chickens, right? So why is that bad? Because we're wiping out all of the easy to kill bacteria and we're only leaving the extremely difficult to kill bacteria alive. And those bacteria now have free reign to go wild and, and, and grow exponentially. So that's why it's very important that you take your antibiotics until you eliminate this last one, right? so that you don't leave any um, possibility for, for them to grow more out of control. Um, so how does this thing become antibiotically resistant, right? We talked about the, with the plasmid, um, picking up from plasmids, you can also have mutations, right? You can have mutations. If you have an enzyme, if you happen to produce an enzyme that deactivates the antibiotic, then you know that's good. If you can eject the antibiotic from the bacteria, that's also good. If you can change the cell wall to prevent the antibiotic from entering, that's also good. And you can um, alter a certain function of the bacteria that an antibiotic targets. Let's look at a bacterial mechanism across energy. If a certain antibiotic interrupts the energy pathway, a mutation that causes bacteria to use a different energy pathway. Could... Oh, oh, okay, I see what they're saying. So it depends on like the target of the antibiotic. If the antibiotic is targeting some part of the bacteria, but the bacteria mutates so that it no longer needs that part to function, then it can survive in the presence of the antibiotic. So basically it's like an arms race, right? The antibiotic is trying to kill off the bacteria and the bacteria is mutating to try to avoid the antibiotics plan, to work around the antibiotics plan. So how does it actually mutate, right? How does that actually work? How does it adapt to an environment? So for that, we need to look into something called the jacob Monod model. And the jacob Monod model is a little bit complex, but we'll go through it. Um, let's see. Oh, this is what I was talking about with the, with the oh yeah, 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 this is what I was talking about with the lag and the log, right? When we have the, when we have the bacteria, right? In this phase, it's not linear because this is a log graph. What it actually looks like is this because it, it, it's, it's increasing exponentially. If you, look, if you look at it as the number of bacteria cells rather than the log of bacteria cells, then you'll see that it's increasing exponentially. Okay, so I wanna talk about the Jacob Monod model. Okay, so, um, how to go over this. So this is a little bit, this is a little bit confusing, but we're going to ultimately, what this is, is a way for the bacteria to respond to its environment and to flip the correct switches on its genes, right? So an operon is the way that prokaryotes regulate their gene expression. And the Jacob Monod model is basically a, a the model, how they modeled this operon to work. So the operon has four sites. It has a it has a promoter site, which is where the RNA polymerase will bind. It has an operator site, which is where the repressor binds, and it has the genes itself. So if we look here, we have a promoter, an operator and it has the genes itself. So what does this mean? This system works to, to control transcription, 
the point is, if we have a bat, so let's consider the example of a, a bacteria that is in the environment. It, it, there's different kinds of sugars in the environment, okay? It could be lactose or glucose. There could be lactose in the environment. There could be glucose in the environment. Now, if we produce, the bacteria should not, what, so it's, is it efficient to produce both sugars at the same time? It's not, right? Because, so, oh, sorry, not to produce both sugars. Uh, let me draw this. So here we have a bacteria, right? And then in the environment, we have some glucose, or actually I prefer green for glucose. You have some glucose and let's go blue for lactose. So if we have both, so the cell is making, is going to make some enzymes, right? So let's just make an enzyme that looks like this. So this is an enzyme and this, oh, actually the enzyme would probably be on the outside. Okay, so if there is, so, the, so it costs us energy to make these proteins, to make these enzymes that can break down the sugar. Right? So the point is for the bacteria to have these enzymes available so that they can break down you know, the, the materials in the environment. Now, if the environment is completely lacking in glucose, right? if there's no glucose present, then why do we need to make this glucose breaking enzyme? We don't need to. That would be a waste of energy because then we've made this enzyme that doesn't do anything because the environment has no glucose in it. So therefore, there is a way for the cell to say, hey, don't actually make this. This is a waste, right? And the way that it does this is through this promoter, through this operon system, which is actually quite uh, efficient. So what it does is, um, so this is just one example. This is called the LAC operon. And the LAC operon is in charge of deciding whether we need the enzyme that's going to break down lactose. So there's, let me just talk about the specific LAC operon and then I'll talk about general. So the LAC operon is off when lactose is absent, right? Why does that make sense? Because if there is no lactose, there's no lactose in the environment, right? If there's no lactose, then I don't need to make the enzyme that breaks down lactose. So if there's no lactose in the environment, then I'm not, so if there's no lactose, da, 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 da. here, see, okay, perfect. This is a, the lac operon. In a glucose rich environment, meaning no lactose, this enzyme comes and binds to this operon, which is called the lac repressor. It's a repressor, and it, so it binds to the, to, the, to the operator site. Operator binding site is where the repressor binds. It binds there because what we're doing is preventing the transcription that leads to the, uh, to the, to the lactase, that leads to the lactase. So you can see, by, by this repressor being here, we have prevented transcription of lactase. Now, if the environment has lactose in it, right? If there's a bunch of lactose in it, then we probably want to transcribe lactase. So the very cool thing is the lac repressor has lactose as its inhibitor. So if there's lactose present in the environment, the lactose will bind to the repressor and force the repressor off of the operon. Now the operon is open and the RNA polymerase is free to actually transcribe this. The RNA polymerase can now, you know, run along the DNA and transcribe this. And what it's going to transcribe is this, is that enzyme, the lactase. And then that lactase can go and 
break down the lactose, which was which was right here. So there's a lot of terminology here, but first I want you to understand the basic concept. The basic concept is this is a way for the bacteria to respond to its environment and only do, it only needs to do what's present in the environment. So it, re, so it doesn't waste energy. Does that part make sense so far before we move on to the specific terminology? Does it make sense what the system is trying to do? Okay, good. If you have a question, you can just post it and then and then we'll talk about it. But yeah, this system is just trying to adapt the bacteria best possible to its environment. Now, this is not the only kind. So what we saw here is that a repressor is present until something binds to it and moves the repressor off. So this is a very specific kind of operon. This is called a negative inducible operon. In a negative inducible operon, the repressor binds the DNA and the gene is off until it turns on. So what does that mean? What we saw here, this guy is negative. So, so, so I like to break it down into like, what are we talking about? If it, so we have two different um, things that we can, it can either be positive or it can be negative. And that can be repressible or it can be inducible. So let's go one at a time. If it's negative, it refers to a repressor protein. A repressor protein is involved. So if there is a repressor protein bound, then it's going to be negative. We're talking about something negative if there's a repressor protein. Now, is it inducible or repressible? So think about what those terms mean. If something is inducible, that means you can activate it, right? You can induce it, right? Think about like um, induced like like uh, delivery, right? Like th where they where they induce the pregnancy to happen maybe before it's supposed to happen, right? Or not before it's supposed to happen, but before it would have happened, right? Induced or repressible, right? Means that you can can turn it off right? You can repress it. You can shut it down. You can deactivate it, right? So that implies if something is inducible and you can activate it, that implies that normally, normally it's off, right? Because if you can activate it, then normally it should be off. And if you can deactivate something, then normally it's on. And that's what we, that's, the difference between inducible and repressible operons. If it's inducible, you can activate it, and normally it's off, and it's not producing that that uh, enzyme. So as we saw here, this lac operon is not normally producing lactose, uh, lactase. It's not normally producing the enzyme that breaks down the lactose. However, if lactose is present, then it will it will turn on, and it can activate. A repressible is the opposite. The repressible is on until it gets turned off. So, yeah. So, da -da 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 -da. when we talk about positive, positive refers to the activator. So, an activator is something like, like this. I think it's cap, right? Yeah, it binds DNA directly. Cap helps RNA polymerase bind to the promoter, resulting in high levels of transcription. So this is so this the transcription is occurring when the activator binds. So this is positive inducible, right? Well, we're, so in this in this operon system, we're not dealing with a repressor. There's no repressor acting on the operator, but rather an activator, a separate. So if something binds to the operator site, it's a repressor. If something binds somewhere else and affects the the you know transcription levels, then it's an activator. So 
there's basically, it's basically just a system of terminology referring to, is this on until it's off or is it off until it's on? That refers to repressible or inducible. And then if it's positive, it's talking about an activator. If it's negative, it's talking about a repressor. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of terminology, but if you understand fundamentally like what the purpose is that it, it adapts to the environment, then you'll be, you'll be able to understand like the point of this. So any questions about this? This is, it's a kind of a niche in depth topic, but it does show up uh, in terms of like, because it's linked to transcription and, and bacterial adaptation. Hopefully, hopefully this made sense. So that's called the, the Jacob Manon model, the model of um, how, how bacteria use their operons to, to adapt to their environment. Okay. All right, so, so along that lines, we're talking about the genetics, right? I think we touched on this a bit last week, but good to just cover it off now. So we talk, this is, so when you take up a plasmid from the extracellular environment, that's called transformation. This is transformation because that plasmid can come in and it can transform the original chromosome. Transformation. This is, it, trans, transformation is a very, very specific term that refers to this, that refers to this process. Another process of bacteria, and remember, we're talking about how bacteria these are three different ways that bacteria can gain genetic diversity, because as we saw, when they when they they don't get any genetic diversity from their binary fission, from their reproduction, because they are just cloning themselves. They're not engaging in anything to to increase their genetic diversity. So how do they get mutation and stuff? Well, these are the three different ways. There's bacterial transformation through plasmid uptake. Then there's um, then there's conjugation. So remember we said something about a pili, right? Um, a pili is this thing that basically sticks out and attaches to another bacteria. So let's break this down. First, the bacteria needs to get the ability to construct this pili, pilus. This pilus looks like this. Okay, so the main thing to understand in this picture here is that this pilus, it looks like it's equally connected, but it's stemming from this bacteria and attaching to this bacteria. Why? Because this bacteria has the F plasmid. So the F plasmid is, is what confers the bacteria the ability to conjugate another bacteria. So this is, um, when it has an F plasmid, it's called an F plus cell. And this one does not have the F plasma, so this is an F minus cell. Otherwise, they're identical. The only difference is that this guy has a plasmid and this guy does not have a plasmid, right? So because he has a plasmid, he can extend this conjugation pilus and attach to the, to the F minus cell. Now, when that happens, that basically creates a bridge between their two. They're now connected, right? Now that they're connected, what happens is the F plasmid can actually copy itself and insert a copy into the other cell. At the same time, other plasmids, not shown here, but if there are other plasmids like you know antibiotic resistance or something, right? There was an antibiotic resistance, it can also go and get passed on to another cell, right? So this is genetic diversity increasing in the bacterial population. And now what happens? Now, this is now an F plus cell. And this guy can now construct his own pilus to another bacteria, right? So that's, that's called conjugation. Two bacteria are conjugating. And this is, this is, this is a pretty important example of how they, um, how they gain genetic diversity. Um, Oh, here's like an even better breakdown. But it's the same thing, basically. This is basically what I said. Um, ba -ba -da -da. Anything else here? 
And this is showing, this is showing the recombination that can occur. Oh, and this one, okay. So this is uh, HFR, which is high frequency recombination. Um, so the plasmid gets, so when the plasmid gets integrated into the chromosome itself, then this is now a, per, this, this bacteria is always going to do this conjugation. So it's a high frequency of recombination cell, and it's always going to do this, and it's always going to give that DNA on, and yeah. So this is, so, so conjugation. Now, lastly, and this is going to be a good link into our next topic, we have, um, oh, it's not here? Maybe it's in the next step. Oh, it's in the next step. Yeah, okay, fine. Transposons. Why do they bring up transposons now? Oh, this is just this is just referring to what we just went in depth into with the Jacob Banan model, basically. How we um how we disrupt how we disrupt certain uh uh genes. Okay. So now we've basically covered what we need to cover about prokaryotes. And now we can start talking about viruses. So yeah, okay. So basically, so here's our first step about viruses. Viruses, so this is the link between viruses and prokaryotes. When a um, when a virus has some viral DNA in it, it can attach to transduction. Transduction, yes. When a virus comes and has some DNA in it, it can inject that DNA into this bacteria. And then that bacteria, uh, the sorry, the the viral DNA can kind of, can basically get linked into mixed up with the chromosomal, the, the host DNA, the host chromosome. And eventually that's going to lead to the possibility of a virus moving bacterial DNA around rather than viral DNA, right? When the, when the, when the, when the viruses are remade, some of the viruses will end up picking up the, um, instead of the viral DNA, they'll end up picking up the bacterial DNA. And the bacterial DNA might get injected into another uh, cell. And that cell, instead of getting infected with viral DNA, will gain some genes from another bacteria that existed. So basically the, the, the virus makes a mistake and instead of injecting viral DNA, it picked up bacterial DNA and it moved it around. This is another way for, for, for that to happen. Um, okay. So that's, that's our transition into, into um, that's our transition into viruses which is obviously a very, very hot topic now. Um, viruses, as we know, are not considered living and they are parasites. Parasites, because they cannot produce, they cannot reproduce on their own. They reproduce by hijacking a cell and they use the cell's machinery to replicate themselves and then they move on. So a virus, looks like this. Okay. So you might have seen you may have seen what uh, SARS-CoV-2 looks like and it basically looks like this. Actually let's just pull up a, a picture of uh, COVID structure. Yeah, so you can see inside we've got the RNA, the viral RNA. And then we have an envelope, right? A bilayer. Then on the outside, he's got glycoproteins, right? These are signaling. These are for signaling for him, for the COVID virus to attach to the cells it wants to attach to and then inject its viral material in. So we see a very similar structure here. And 
so we have two basic, basically two different types of viruses. We have one that is in a capsid, but not in a membrane. So it's just in this capsid. And the capsid is the capsid is a protein envelope. It's not a membrane, it's a it's a protein. Um, and that protein, uh, do, do, do. capsid proteins are always encoded by the virus genome, meaning that it's the virus that provides, oh, yeah, that's fine. Capsid protein. Okay, so the capsid was produced by this viral genetic material, but the matrix, this lipid envelope, is actually usually stolen from the cell once the virus leaves. So let me see, uh, viral envelope. So once, yeah, here's a good picture. So here's the, the, you know, the virus is in here. It reproduces its viral DNA. It makes some capsid proteins. Those capsid proteins now cover the viral DNA. But now once it's leaving, right, it steals the bilayer from the host cell. And now it's enveloped. That's how it does it. And you'll notice how the, the, the glycoproteins that it needs, in, in the case of COVID, the spike protein, right? The RNA also forces our, our um, endoplasmic reticulum to produce those proteins, right? And then those proteins go onto the cells on the surface of the membrane. And then once the virus is leaving, it just picks up that membrane with all of the spike proteins it needs and it leaves. So it's pretty efficient and it's pretty scary. Like it, it completely takes over the cell. It knows exactly what it needs to do. It knows exactly what it needs to make. It, it reproduces, it replicates itself and it leaves. And then it's off to infect another um, cell. So yeah, so basically that's the two, the two different structures, right? It can be non-enveloped or it can be enveloped. Like they're saying, they borrow a patch from the host membranes. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Now, again, viral structures don't have, uh, they just have a protein and they just have their own little viral RNA. They don't have a nucleus. They don't have chromosomes. They don't have organelles, nothing. They are literally just DNA or RNA in a protein packet. That's it. Bacteriophages are, to me, like the most terrifying virus because like they literally look like spiders. And it's like, it, it's, it's quite scary that like that they exist because they just come and they attach themselves to a cell and then they just inject. They, it's, straight, it's straight up like a, a, a very, very tiny like walking injection. Um, so it walks around and injects its, vi its viral RNA into, uh, into, into, the, into a bacteria, right? This is exactly what we see here. This is a bacteriophage. They have the structure. They find uh, a, a cell, they inject their material in, and then that's going to lead to more of them being produced. So I, I think these are absolutely terrifying. Um, but they also have some good stuff by accident like we talked about with the uh with the with the recombination happening here by accident but i don't know they just give me the creeps okay so the virus can have can be can have dna or it can have rna um and in viruses viruses are actually pretty like they don't care about rules or anything, right? Like we usually have double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA as mRNA, right? Viruses don't care. Viruses have double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, single-stranded RNA. It, it's a huge variety of um, genetic material that we find in viruses. But they all have the same code, the same, you know, ATCG, as eukaryotes and prokaryotes, because you know they need to hijack our systems. They have to hijack our systems, so they 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 conserve that code so that they're compatible with us. 
And I, I remember I mentioned the size, right? A virus is about 10 times smaller than a typical bacterial cell and at least 100 times smaller than a typical eukaryotic cell. So if a virus is 100 nanometers, then a bacteria is, a, is one micrometer, and then a plant or animal cell is 10 to 100 micrometers. So this is just, um, just to generally understand like the scale of what you're looking at, because you could be asked a question of like, you know, a patient is sick or something, they did some kind of like uh, filtration, size filtration or something, and they found that this thing of like 10 micrometers was the culprit. What is the 10 micrometer? What, what is it possibly, right? And so if you know it's 10 micrometers, then it has to be um, maybe like a plant, a plant cell or something, right? Like, because, the, because you can clearly distinguish between bacteria and eukaryotic cells and um, viral uh, capsid proteins based on their size, because they're all very uh, far away from each other. Okay. So now we'll talk a little bit more about how the viruses are actually, um, you know, reproducing. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so ah, uh, yeah, so okay, we have some nice pictures here. Um, spike proteins, right? So here's the non enveloped, right? Just RNA or DNA inside, surrounded by the capsid. If it has a bilayer from when it left the cell, it has a bilayer, and on that bilayer, it has some spike proteins. The, the membrane layer is also really, really good for, for them to infect other cells because the membrane can just kind of um, allow them to get in more easily into the, into the cell because the membrane will just, um, the cell is going to endocytose, like we talked about endocytosis, where the cell can kind of eat the, the vesicle, right? And so now we have this, this bacteriophage, right? And the bacteriophage, once it attaches onto the cell surface, it's going to, it's, it's an injection. Like uh, it's a straight up an injection. It injects its material into the, into the cell. So basically once that injection happens and it delivers the, the nucleic, nucleic acid material into the cell, right? What's going to happen? Okay, so this, some interesting things can happen here. First off, mm, let's see. Yeah, that's fine. So there's two kinds of different life cycles. Let's start over here. So the bacteriophage just came in and it attached to the cell and it entered its genome, right? And now let's say that the, the virus, the viral DNA is transcribed and it produces all the things it needs and it starts breaking the cell down, right? It starts breaking the cell down and it starts producing more of itself. And eventually the cell is going to burst. The cell is going to die and there's going to be a, a huge release of all these bacteriophages, right? This is called the lytic cycle. And I remember my mnemonic for this was like, it was like lytic, like TikTok, like the cell is running out of time because the, this thing is just going to produce a bunch, a bunch, a bunch until it breaks out. Now there's an alternative, right? Instead of the virus doing this right away and, um, and blowing up the cell immediately, what it can do is enter silently have its genome integrated into the 
into the cell. This is almost a little bit more scary because it silently puts its genome into the cell's genome, right? And then the cell has no idea that anything is wrong because it, it wouldn't necessarily be wrong, right? Remember, the, the, this host genome in prokaryotic cells is in the nucleoid region. It's not prevented. It doesn't have any protection from new plasmids or anything. It's designed to be mutated quickly. So once that viral genome gets integrated, right, and we start doing binary fission and reproducing, we have a bunch of copies of cells that all have this viral genome. And at some point, you know, depending on maybe the environmental factors or whatever, at some point, the viral genome is going to excise itself and say, okay, let's go. It's time to produce, it's time to go back into this idea. Let's break down the cell and produce a bunch, right? Except this time, instead of doing it for just one cell, it's doing it for for how, however many cells that, you know, and it's exponential again, right? Because from one to two, two to four, four to six, four to eight, right? All of them are gonna burst and they're going to produce a mass number of viral particles. So it's pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, yeah. So the lysogenic, so they're both, they both exist. There's a lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. Um, And then they'll butt out and then, yeah, viral genomes. Oh, this, yeah. So this is a good, this is a good look at like more in depth of like what's actually happening, right? Once the, once the virus enters the cell, it breaks apart and the RNA is now available. Now, this is one very important thing. The, oh, this is, I think this is HIV. Yeah, this is a retrovirus. Okay, wait, before we do retrovirus, do we have like a regular virus? Uh, because there's many different kinds of, of, of viruses. This one's, this one's a typical one. So at S plus, plus SSRNA is basically like mRNA. So when this happens, right, this RNA comes in and the host ribosome like the host, like the ribos, our own ribosomes will start translating it because they can't really, they can't really tell that this is not, that this is a viral mRNA. So those will start translating it and they'll start building viral proteins, the capsid proteins, right? At the same time, the virus brings with it its own polymerase, its own polymerase. And that polymerase is going to allow for the production of more copies of the original ssRNA strand, the original viral RNA. By hijacking the host ribosomes to make more proteins and using its own polymerase to make more of its RNA, it's going to produce more proteins. Now, if you look over here, we have, if we look at a retrovirus, a retrovirus is really interesting. Let me see if I have more. A retrovirus is using RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. What does that mean? If it's RNA-dependent, that means it's using a strand of RNA. And if it's a DNA polymerase, that means it's creating DNA. So using a strand of RNA as a template, it's going to create DNA. Why does a retrovirus want to create DNA? Because... The, vir the RNA comes in, it uses its reverse transcriptase or RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It uses that, and then it does this process called reverse transcription. So, so let's, let's explore what that actually means. Normal transcription, right? Well, remember our process of translation and transcription. We start with, in our cells, we start with DNA in our chromosomes, right? If we want to produce a protein from that DNA, we create an RNA out of it, right? Through, through, through transcription. And then when the RNA 
is taken out of the nucleus, the ribosomes will translate it into a protein, right? Now here, we're having something different happen. Here, we start with viral RNA, which is an mRNA or an ssRNA, which is basically, which is very similar to, to, the, to, the, to mRNA, how mRNA functions. When we have this viral RNA, right, and a reverse trend, a, a, an enzyme. So, so, so one other thing to, to expand upon here is that the enzyme that's creating an mRNA from a DNA would be a DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Why is that? Because it's using the DNA as a template. It depends on the DNA to produce RNA, right? So now, but in this virus situation, we're doing RNA and creating viral DNA. So if that's the case, right? Then it's not DNA dependent, it's RNA dependent. And it's not RNA polymerase because we're not producing RNA, we're producing DNA. So it's DNA polymerase. And so this enzyme, right, this, struct, this type of enzyme is called a reverse transcriptase. Why? Because it's reversing transcription. Because transcription is our process of DNA to RNA. But viruses, you know, contradict this. They go from RNA to DNA. So if this process is transcription, if the process of DNA to R RNA is transcription, then the process of RNA to DNA is reverse transcription. So therefore, the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase, aka RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So all of that to show you that, to really understand why retroviruses are so um, unique, I guess, because they, they, can, they can undo the central dogma. They really are, are just a different breed. Um, so what they're doing is they're reversing this RNA to DNA, and that DNA can get integrated into the host DNA. Now, when this, ha and this is really tough because this is happening even in human cells, right? So even in animal, even though we have this uh, nucleus, um, I mean, this nuclear membrane, right? Because it's DNA, because it's undoing this transcription, the DNA can get integrated in. And now once there is DNA integrated in, uh, now it's really bad because once the polymerases go, to create mRNAs, what are they doing? They're accidentally creating mRNAs of the viral DNA, right? So now we're creating a bunch of viral DNA. And now that this viral DNA is out there, it's doing what we talked about. It's creating those spike proteins, it's creating those capsid proteins, and it itself is getting replicated, right? Because, because of this production. And this, is, and this is why HIV is such a terrible disease because it, it, once, once it's already embedded in there, it's quite difficult to, to do something about it. Um, so yeah, so this is, this is how retroviruses work. Um, any questions so far? I think I've been talking for a while. Um, This is a nice picture too. HIV fuses to the cell. It gets, it gets, you know, and, and endogenously like pulled in. The viral DNA is formed by reverse transcription. Then the viral DNA can get integrated into the host DNA. And this is called a provirus. Oh yeah, that's important terminology. If it's, if it's a, 
a, a, a, a provirus means that it's been fully integrated. So now it's no longer a virus. It's a provirus because it's fully integrated and it can, it kind of has hijacked like, it's done its job. It's hijacked the cell and now it can just chill and make as much virus as it wants. So now it produces new viral RNA. That viral RNA is going to do what we said. It's going to make viral proteins. It's going to make, and then it's going to embed itself in there and it's going to butt off. And now it's got a new viral particle. So yeah. So let's see. We talked about the lytic cycle, the lysogenic cycle. Oops. I don't know what I just opened. Lytic cycle. Yeah. So once the bacteria with viral genetic material is called a prophage or a provirus, um, bust down. Prions and viroids. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So these are another thing. So you might have heard of. So prions are misfolded proteins with a defective structure. And they also, the scary part is they trigger other proteins to adopt that structure. So we don't, I don't think we fully know why this happens, but it's very scary because they don't rely on genetic material at all. They're simply defective proteins. And for some reason, they cause other proteins to also defect. So why this is happening is very strange. Um, one of the, one of the, so yeah, it's literally just a, a structural problem with the protein folding. So here's a normal one where the amino acids are, are amino acids are in alpha helix amino acids in sheet form, but in this case, they fold it up into a beta helix instead. And this is, oh yeah, this is actually related to Alzheimer's because um, of misfolded proteins causing a big, misfolded proteins are a big component of Alzheimer's disease. So this can be produced by, you can have spontaneous mutation, which an example is mad cow disease. You can inherit a, 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 a gene that already misfolds the protein, right? Or there's actually stuff about cannibalism because if you if you if you are cannibalistic, right, and you eat flesh that has a misfolded protein, that misfolded protein is going to affect your proteins. So there there has been studies about like tribal societies that engage in cannibalism and how their prion rates, their prion disease rates are higher than um, those who don't engage in cannibalism. And the problem is that when we have these prions, they accumulate, they build up in the cells. And that, that's what you'll see in Alzheimer's disease. They build up in the cells and they cause cell death. And they also convert normal proteins into prions and cause a problem. So this is, this prions are, are quite, uh, quite difficult to deal with. On the other hand, we have something called viroids, which are are circular RNA structures that we find in plants. They infect plants. So this is not something super, um, you know, super high yield or whatever. It's just something to, to be aware of that there are even, you know, nucleic acid infecting plants, not just, uh, not just humans. So we talked about yeah, aerobes. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, energy sources. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we said that the electron transport chain happens on the membrane, right? Just like it would in the mitochondrial membrane. The energy source, uh, if it's a photo, so so we have so when you describe a bacteria, you can describe how it how, where they get their energy from, right? If it's a photo autotroph, right? That photo means that it gets its energy from light. And then an autotroph means that the carbon source it uses is CO2. 
So a photoautotroph uses light and you gets its carbons from CO2. That sounds like a plant to me, right? Now a chemoheterotroph, right? Chemo means that it's not using light, it's using ATP production, right? It's not photosynthesizing, but using respiration. If it's a chemoheterotroph, right? And hetero means that it doesn't get the carbons from CO2, it gets the carbons from other animals, right? It gets from, from carbon sources. So those would be animals, right? Like us, right? We use ATP and we get carbon from, you know, eating, right? Then we have photoheterotrophs using light production for, for, for using photosynthesis, but getting its carbon sources from animals. This is carnivorous plants. This is, I've actually seen some very interesting carnivorous plants that like they are really like interesting. They trap like massive bugs and then they just digest them with like acidic juices. And then, yeah, that's, that's where they get their nutrients and stuff. Um, then we have chemoautotrophs, which are like archaea bacteria because they're using ATP, not light because they're not necessarily in a, in a light situation, right? but they are producing, uh, they are utilizing CO2 to, to get their, um, their carbon. Um, this is kind of, this is kind of a little bit more specific than you need to know. Uh, but sometimes there are mutants that cannot synthesize a molecule that they need. Usually those molecules are amino acids, right? Um, Endosymbiotic theory showed up a lot, actually showed up on my exam. Um, endosymbiotic theory is that because mitochondria have their own DNA and because they, it's basically the idea and because they kind of use the ATP synthase the exact same way that prokaryotes do, it's theorized that mitochondria are just bacteria that kind of got adjusted to our cells. And then we just form like a mutual um, symbiotic relationship with them. And they just became part of our eukaryotic cells. So that's a, that's a theory and, and it's good to know because you really want to understand how mitochondria are similar to bacteria in, for our purposes. Uh, we talk about chemotaxis, talk about our production. Plasmids. So plasmids, um, you can see the antibiotic resistance in red here. You can see we have a promoter site to have the gene to have the gene be transcribed. These guys are very important, and these guys are also can be used to mass produce a protein. This is really cool because if we basically put this into a bacteria and it has the protein that we want, we can just produce that protein, right? The cells, in a sense, we are hijacking the bacteria to, to, to make that protein for us. So that's the power of plasmids. Um, we talked about the different types of bacteria. And then this is all cell stuff. Okay, so I think that's about it for this section the viral transaction we talked about. We talked about retrovirus. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully this makes sense how, how a virus comes in, how it not copies its own genome and it hijacks the machinery to create its proteins, then it assembles itself and, and, and it releases, right? Oh, these, these are great pictures. Yeah, these are really nice pictures. How, how, the, how it totally, completely, utterly hijacks the cell. And the retrovirus we talked about, it's a little bit more in depth because it goes through that process of, of hijacking the DNA itself. And then, um, and then yeah, the cell itself becomes a, a factory for the virus. Okay. So that's... That's this section, a little bit of a shorter section. One second. <laughs>